What's up, guys? Yeah, you know what time it is. It's another Saturday afternoon. How many live streams have we started with that saying? Oh my gosh. <laughs> but you know, it's it's 12 o'clock. I mean, maybe if you're not if you're watching after on demand, then it's not. But uh, if you're watching live, yes, it is 12 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. And what better way to spend it than with these two wonderful guys talking about the solo careers and side projects of fellow prog musicians? Of course, we have Mr. Scott Davis from the band Mythologic over here. What's happening, Scott? Another Saturday in the trenches. <laughs> Another Saturday in the park, right? <laughs> and we got, you know, you see Lauren here all the time, man. He's kind of been a mainstay. We so got Mr. sick of Lauren me. They're so sick of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, people love you, man. People keep coming back. They're shouting for Lauren, and they're going to be shouting for Scott Davis, too, especially because he's got that awesome Genesis shirt on. Love it. Love it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So today we are going to be talking about, well, I just kind of hinted at it before, but we're going to be talking about the, the solo careers and side projects of prog rock musicians. So they could have a, they could have completely jumped ship from the prog rock genre, or they could have, you know, you know, they could have stayed with it and done their own solo thing, kind of like, you know, Chris Squire or Stephen Wilson. Um, or they could have remained in their big bands and still did side projects on the side too, right? There's lots of cases, and we're going to be doing our best to cover them all in a short amount of time. <laughs> but uh, before we get into that, uh, Scott Davis has got some cool stuff to tell us. Scott, you you are the band Myth of Logic. That's me. Guilty. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, so how can we buy some of your CDs, man? Well, uh, I've got two out. The first one was uh, a release November uh, 11th of uh, 2022. Awesome. Surrounded by ghosts. Cover art by our good friend Charlie Roy. If you don't know about Charlie, seek him out. And the second album came out New Year's Eve this last year. Pictures from a previous dream. Uh, those are the first two chapters in what I'm calling the Here and There trilogy. And I'm in my studio right now as we speak today, uh, hard at work on the last chapter, Light at the End, which will tie up the story of Robin, my, my central character. Uh, you can go check out mythoflogic.com. There's lots of information there. There is actually what I'm calling a screenplay that is, it fills in the blanks of the story that the, the lyrics only hint at for musical purposes. And uh, I'm fleshing that out as we speak. I, the, the, the whole screenplay for Surrounded is on the website, and I'm uh, still finishing up the one for pictures. But all our stuff is available on all the usual streaming services, Bandcamp you can purchase, all that sort of jazz. Um, it, awesome. It's all out there for people. They want to find it. Love it. <clears throat> love it. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, Mythologic is great stuff. I'm still waiting on my CDs to come, but I've been listening to you on the Apple Music, and it's just been great. So that's that's awesome, man. Thanks they're in Toronto. <laughs> What's that? They're in Toronto? Oh, they're, good. They're, they've passed through customs. They're on the way. So. <laughs> they're almost here. Perfect. And we got Mr. Lauren Murphy in the house from the Garden of Delights on Deep Nuggets Radio. He's got a show coming up tonight at 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. That's 2 on the Pacific. So if you happen to be watching today... After the show, go jump on deepnuggets.com and uh, check out his show because I know he's got some really cool stuff up his sleeve. Isn't that right, Lauren? I do. That is right, Cody. <laughs> I, I just right. bookmarked it. <laughs> it's, uh, good. Yeah, yeah, definitely, Scott. Definitely check it out. I, I do a show there on Thursday nights and Lauren does Saturday. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, it's a heavy yeah. prog one today. Normally, I uh, mix it up a little bit more and, you know, I throw in some more classic rock maybe a little 80s stuff that i like singer songwriter folk but today is really heavy on the prog just because i felt like being indulgent with it <laughs> so prog fans will will enjoy today's show for sure well and we can say that for the people watching here on the stream too yes yes even during the live or afterwards hey whatever man as long as you're here thank you so much and uh, we are going to talk about uh, we are going to talk about some solo albums from here. Let's talk about Mr. Stephen Wilson. What a career he's had, eh? Outside of Porcupine Tree. Yeah, I'm, I'm not crazy about that one you've got there, but but yeah, oh, I love this one. I, <laughs> I've I'm I, I like it. I so far I like it. Yeah. Um, I haven't yeah. fallen head over heels for it. It's not Grace for Drowning. But no, certainly it not. shouldn't be grace for drowning because no. if Stephen has done one thing in his career, that is evolve and change and yeah. 
yeah, I expect that from him. So, and that's cool. And you know, I I I appreciate that too from any any artist. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, I don't always like it, you know. And sometimes I love it. You know? Oh but yeah, yeah, strange. absolutely. You know, but yeah. His his career has been. I saw him live, and uh, and he was pretty fantastic, actually. Yeah, I saw him in a small place. It was the uh, the Raven tour, a uh, small place here in locally in St. Petersburg, downtown St. Pete. It's a small. It was a small theater, maybe maybe eight hundred people, maybe. Wow, if yeah. That uh, <laughs> Gar Gary Husband was playing drums. He was filling in, and he was reading most of the show off charts and just nailing everything. <laughs> Nick Beggs on bass. Ooh, yeah. Nick Beggs, awesome. Yeah, Guthrie on guitar, of course. Uh, it was just a spell. You know, I came out of there thinking to myself after that show, I was not old enough to see the lamb presented live, but I bet the people walking out felt a lot like I felt walking out of the Raven show. Yeah, it, it, uh, he he really was great. And I think he had Nick Beggs when I saw him, too. But it was um, what's his name, Cody on drums, the guy from Steve Hackett band. Or Craig Blundell. Craig uh, Blundell. Yeah, Blundell. He, he was very good. I just saw him with Hackett. He's, he's yeah. And I love Frost, so. Oh, me uh, too, man. Yeah. Right, me too. Yeah. He uh, normally I was, you know, because I saw a pork about tree quite a few times, and it was. Yep, there you go. Gavin <laughs> Harrison, right? But, mm -hmm. but I liked um, uh, Craig too a lot. Thought he did a great job. Yeah. Well, you guys, hey, you guys did this, Steve Hackett. Yeah. I too have seen all the lineups over the last probably ten years. I've seen all the lineups of this band. Uh, he's had everyone from Roy Nestolt to uh, Jonas Reinberg, uh, Reingold, sorry, <laughs> Reingold, <laughs> Reinberg, oh, and uh, Nick Bags, and uh, what can I say? Nick Bags was freaking awesome, man, and Craig Blundell and Gary O'Toole, and uh, the only yeah. mainstays have been uh, Rob Townsend, Roger King, uh, Steve himself, obviously, and Nad Sylvan. Uh, the, but the bass and drums have changed quite a few times, but uh, it's never been bad. Oh, I saw them with uh, Nick DiVirgilio, too. And oh. uh, he's, yeah, yeah, he's always got a good uh, a good group of musicians behind him and uh, always playing great stuff. You know, I've seen Steve seven times. How many, how many times have you guys seen Steve? Probably uh, about the same. Twice for me, yeah. Twice. First time I saw him was on an acoustic trio tour with his brother and roger mm. he came in 2005 to hamilton place um here in, wow. near where cody and i live the, there's a, a tiny little there was a big venue called hamilton place but it has a a tiny little studio theater and he played there very intimate like dinner theater kind of setting with uh just an acoustic trio and he was great and then he came out afterwards to meet everyone you know not no paid vip stuff or anything just came out <laughs> us all he was great yeah that's awesome steve so, was uh, this being his first solo album yeah what do you guys think of this one smash or pass <laughs> smash that's smash. Smash. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's definitely that was a trick question guys i, know. Steve, I don't steve i don't normally say smash but, but steve walsh and phil a yeah. are on it so that 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 alone but it's steve hackett you know Steve's always maintained he's caught some criticisms over the years, I think, for as many albums albums as he's released. And there's a certain same equality to some of them. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that as samey. I see that as consistency. He has a standard that yeah. his music has to reach. Uh, first album I ever bought from Steve was uh, Highly Strung. Okay. And okay. At the same time, I bought the 12 inch single of uh cell 151 it was a dance mix that was really cool but on the flip side of that was a live version of the air conditioned nightmare which still makes the hair stand up on my arm i love that song i really wish the current band would play that song because it's so powerful and melodic and it's everything that prog should be I mean, um, I was, it's funny because you know when you say i wish he would play that song i was just saying this a couple of weeks ago on the show, my show, I mean, that he's had so much material. You know, it's album tour, album tour, album tour. He plays a couple of new token pieces, and then they're forgotten forever. Mm -hmm. And over time, you know, you look back, because I played something from the Guitar Noir album. And oh, yeah. Um, Sierra Quemada, 
right? Was, mm. I love that piece. Nice choice. You know, and where are all these pieces now? You know, they they sort of get forgotten, and you know, there's only so much room in a set list, but because he jams it so full of, of the same stuff. pieces over and over again, there's barely any room for anything else, and it's a, it's just kind of a shame. It might maybe it's a necessary shame, but. It's a shame. Shame that, of riches. <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. Some things get so forgotten. Thank God he's out there paying respect to the early Genesis stuff, and they're playing it so flawlessly. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, I mean, yeah, he. it would be nice to see him play something from Beyond the Shrouded Horizon once in a while. I mean, that came out in uh, 2011, I think, and he just, uh, I think maybe he played it a bit at the time, but then, like you say, he does a handful of older stuff, and then whatever's new at the time or up and coming out, that he's writing, he'll play it, and then that tour, that's it. And then it's and then, gone. Yeah. And then the next thing, and then like you know, when I saw the Wolf Light, it was the Acolyte to Wolf Light tour because it was also the 40th anniversary of this. Yeah. About nine years ago when I saw it, wow, time flies, man. I tell you that. Yeah, but uh, he played a heavy dose. <laughs> he played a heavy dose of the Wolf Light album, and then I saw him six more times after that, and never again. And I love the Wolf Light album. Oh, that, that's a good one. Yep. That's one of his top 10 albums. He's got a couple of albums I don't love so much. Like, I'm not a big fan of the Bay of Kings record. Oh. Um, but I oh. love most of his music. And I really like that one. <laughs> I love Bay of Kings. I love Bay of Kings, too. <laughs> well, I, last time I heard it, I was a lot younger. And I, I'm probably more open to it now that I'm, you know, in my mid-20s and more, I don't know, experienced overall. <laughs> the last time I heard that it was probably you know eight to ten years ago, and uh, I played it and I was like, I'm not really feeling this too much, but uh, I love most of his other stuff. Like that's you know he's got like thirty albums out, and if you like twenty five of them, that's pretty good. <laughs> sure, yeah. And uh, speaking of new, this is a this is a very new album came out last last year. How about the new one from Trevor Rabin? Oh yeah, yep. This yeah. is a smash for me. I don't usually do the smash or pass thing, but we're talking about the do's and don'ts here. This is a definite do for me. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think this is awesome top to bottom, personally. You know, you really have to appreciate Trevor. If you don't appreciate, you know, 90125 and, and what he brings to an individual party at any given time, you won't care for Rio. But I would dare say if you give it a chance, you might anyway. Because it's so masterful. Um, it is. And I like is. 90125. <laughs> I, I love 90125. I was, you know, I was at an age where it was like, yeah, it's yes. You know, yes is like pizza. Even when it's not so good, it's really pretty good. So, you know, and I love 90125. So, uh, but yeah, uh, I like that album a lot. Rio is, is the songwriting is top notch. Um, he's singing better than maybe he ever has, uh, honestly. And of course, the yeah. guitar playing. I'm not even going to talk about the guitar playing because that's obvious. Um, yeah, yeah. There's specific tracks on this um, where he's just going ham on it, man. Yep, <laughs> he's just he's just happening. <laughs> Lauren, what do you think of this album? A do or don't? Well, you you basically always bring up this album, and I always say the same thing. It's <laughs> it's okay. yeah, but we got new viewers, man. <laughs> okay, well, for the new viewers, it's okay. I, I like Trevor Rabin a lot, mm -hmm. but it's okay. I've I've listened to it probably mm, four times all the way through maybe, um, and it's you know it's usually I have a guitar and amp repair business here in St. Pete, and usually I'll just put music on and let it roll while I'm working, and that one's been rotated several times since it came out, and uh, I I enjoy it. It's it's a good one, yeah. It's a it just especially the song "Big Mistakes." It just feels good to listen to, you know. It's just yeah. it's just one of those. It's 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 not that far off from maybe something like "Big Generator," but I I really like "Big Generator," so there's that. And me too. yeah, I do too. Yeah, you have to um, get you have to get into Onion before I start really disliking. Yes, and even then, there's still four really great songs on that one. So. Like a shock to the system, I would have waited forever. Lift me up, and what's the fourth one? The more we live, uh, <laughs> I'm okay with masquerade, but that's really a, a Steve House solo thing. Uh, what is the other one that's on there? I, be, I believe it is lift me up. Lift me up starts off with that that crazy instrumental stuff, but that's not the beginning. There's that wacky. Uh, 
Now, anyway, no, th- th- those those are the tracks on that. There was just too many too many cooks in that particular soup for it to be anything other than just lame. There is not <laughs> there is not one bit of Rick Wakeman anywhere on that record, and no one needs to tell me that. All you yeah. got to do is listen to it. It doesn't make it bad. He wasn't on nine hundred one two five either. It just yeah. makes it. It's yeah. It, it's but anyway, tenuous is yeah. Presenting well, it's one of those albums where we all know the four, maybe five, like super great songs on it. All the Yes fans know what they are. For me, it's <laughs> the more we live. That's a great song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's Anderson at his at his finest, I think. Um, I yeah, think that we, was a, a Squire and Sherwood composition. But I mean, uh, the vocal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The vocal is what I'm talking about there, yeah. I mean, I think, honestly, uh, I wish more people would appreciate the latter. I I oh. love that album. I love it. I love everything about it. And when it came out, I just kind of, it just got past me. I ignored it. And uh, recently I've rediscovered it. It's masterful. It really it is. is. I like Homeworld a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you, Scott. Um, except for I've loved it since it came out because, well, side note, I was born the year before. Ouch. <laughs> and and my dad, my dad was always up on the new Yes albums and anything Yes that was happening at the time, especially particularly when John was in the band. He does still now, but not as much. So the latter, when I was born, my gosh, that was some probably some of the first music I ever heard in my life, and we just listened to that thing over and over. Then you know came the Beatles and Paul McCartney, who had just put out Flaming Pie, mm-hmm. um, and Zeppelin, and and all that other stuff. But that Yes album, I'm telling you, I know every track on that, every everything. I just I love it, love it, love it. Brings back absolutely great memories of hanging out with my dad, listening to that, and so. Even if it sucked, it would still be nostalgic for me. But it doesn't suck. It's really good. It's I really good album. all the way through. I love that album. Speaking of John Anderson, obviously this is a massive do from probably all three of us. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> what do you think, Scott? Um, It's, it's a bit of a weird one. <laughs> it's... it's uh... I have a, a, a sort of a weird relationship with that album. Uh, love the cover. Absolutely adore the cover. It is um, a weird album. It, it's, it's not that it's impenetrable on the order of topographic, uh, but it's that it's... Uh, I, think, I think at the time, John needed to get that out of his system. Yeah. And I, I am... I, whenever I hear it, I enjoy it. And I do listen to it. I own it. Um, I always, I, I'm always left saying, oh, if he'd have gone and made another one a year later, you know, now that he'd gotten that first one out of his system, if he had gone and made another one a year later, I just feel like he, he would have really made, uh, an across the board classic because there's so much hinted at by that album to me. That's just my own takeaway from it. Uh, um, that's a great point. It is a, it is a thumbs up, but like I said, it was tough for me to get to the thumbs up. Certainly not the worst of the yes solo albums in that period. <laughs> oh, well, what's, no. what's the worst one? We gotta we gotta cover it. And there's there's no uh well, for there's me, no the, the Alan White record is I don't Ramshackle is a little bit patchy. I've well, never liked, it. I've never liked the Mraz record. Um uh, never warmed to that. But I the mean, story of I yeah. yeah, fish out of water, masterpiece. Yeah, uh, Steve Howe's record masterpiece. I would put, I would put Squires and Howe's one and two, and uh, John's just right tightly after those, and the other two are kind of also rands just for me. But they're all, you know, having said that, they're all listenable. Um, oh yeah, they're all the Alan, the Alan White record just doesn't speak to me personally as no. much. Well, he, you know, he doesn't. And this is no disrespect to Alan. No, not at all, because he's one of my favorite drummers on the who have ever lived on the planet. But mm-hmm. he doesn't write anything on that album. Nope, he wasn't there yet. Then why make a solo album? Because they all had to have one at that time. That was the I guess so the, the thing they were going for. That was they the all deal. did one. It was like yeah. the Kiss solo albums, you know. They before all did Kid. one. <laughs> yeah, before Kiss, no, before Kiss. These are, 
these are definitely better than those. So yeah. Oh, <laughs> of course. Oh <laughs> yeah. For me, the Yes solo albums go this one and this one. Well, yeah, yeah that's that, that uh, our, yeah, ob yeah. Well, obviously. Yeah. That was already yeah. I think this is perfect. Yeah. I think these two albums are absolute tens out of ten. Um, you guys know that obviously you probably do know the story of the cover on, of this. <laughs> um, I think I remember something vaguely, but go ahead and tell it. <laughs> well, he was at the museum. Uh, where where there was um, like the wax figures or whatever of the of the six wives of Henry the Eighth there, yeah. and they wouldn't let him get a picture with with them for the cover. So uh, instead, he just kind of snuck by and got his camera guy to take a photo quick while he walked by them. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> That's why he's covering up one of them. See, you can kind of see her peeking around, but he's like he's just looking at the guy taking the photo, like take it quick. <laughs> It's like the Chris Squire one. He that was just him coming down the elevator in the hotel he was staying at, and they just snapped a picture of him and went, "There's your cover." Really? Yeah. yeah. It's weird how that stuff works out sometimes. Cause, yeah, because it's a, it was a weird door or something. Yeah. Huh. And it's a, it's an awful lot better than uh, Mike Rutherford's acting very strange cover. <laughs> where, uh, where Mike was like, "You know what I think I'll wear for my album cover shoot." Uh, a fedora and a cutoff sweatshirt. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> At least that album has Stuart Copeland on it. <laughs> Good point. Uh, it, it's not a small creeps day, which I didn't pull out, but that is a great mention because not only did he have an awesome career with Genesis, he had a couple of good solo albums, you know, small creeps day and stuff, but then he had the side project. Mike and the Mechanics, who were pretty popular at one point, kind of almost running parallel, not really parallel to Genesis, because Genesis was huge. They, and Mike was too, but not the same, but they, still very Mike successful. Mike and the Mechanics were, were a lot more than pretty popular for a while. They, they, were they had, they had yeah. massive hits. Huge. Those, those, oh, no. records, those, those records are stunning pop records they really are they really are i i love my mechanics and still do i will i will sit down and listen to those records right now and enjoy listening to them they're uh very well produced and well written and i think my favorite one is beggar on the beach of gold i think that that one has some great tracks on it any but, band with paul carrick and um um uh, what's the other singer's name the other paul paul young Paul Young, thank you. Yeah. Those two guys could sing the phone book, and I would say, take my money. You know, yeah. th those are two of the best singers that there are ever. Uh, and that was genius having both of those guys in that band. It was, it, it really was. Songs were great. Yeah. Love me some Mike and the Mechanics. We got they're on my they're on my list. <laughs> we got Kyle from All Media Reviews. What's happening, Kyle? We also got Zeb as well. Making some comments here. Pretty cool stuff. Hello, everyone. And if you're just joining now, welcome. <laughs> We're having a blast here on Brockway's Vinyl Bites, as we usually are. And, uh, yeah, so where are we going to go from now? We already talked about Stephen Wilson. Uh, well, okay, let's talk about one that is kind of a solo album, but you wouldn't really know it because of all the work that he did with his other band at the time. And the fact that this album was recorded at the same time as an album with his other band called the mothers of invention frank zappa overnight sensation this is considered a frank solo album right well apostrophe is considered a, a frank and the mothers album but to any zappa diehard we know that they go hand in hand i mean <laughs> what can well, you say that, but the mothers had like different lineups and stuff too you know there's a big difference between the very early mothers and by the time you get to uh uh what is it one size fits all you know calling that mothers of invention it's you know hard yeah. to do the same thing but it's all frank yeah yeah when, when you're when you're composing all the music and i use that word intentionally because you're writing it all out on sheet music by the time frank got to that stage it was frank and everybody else yeah you know you're yeah. composing everyone's parts for them yeah so Here play this yeah so that i mean that's it's that's like classical musicians or something yeah. you know it's like no deviation <laughs> whatsoever but how could you deviate from something like the black page you know it's 
it has to be played as is if you can even play it. Yep, absolutely right. This box set is fantastic. It's it's not a very big one, but it's super cool. I love the Dolby Atmos mix of the album inside this, and I hope they do the same for Apostrophe for this year because it's turning 50. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is the 50th anniversary of this. And uh, just what a wicked album. This one changed my life. Um, so this one's a massive do for me. <laughs> Even oh, though it is not very far removed from... Actually, it's not far removed at all from the Mothers of Invention stuff he was doing at this time. Like this mid-70s period, it's not its not a far cry away from, from that stuff. Um, like some of these other solo albums we're talking about. You know, this doesn't Frank, sound like, like Relayer. I don't even differentiate between Frank and the Mothers in, in my own collection or even in my own head i just i never think oh i gotta listen to a mother's album it's just frank You're like, right i know i'm the same way i just i was going through my cd collection i was like yeah this will be a this will be a funny little uh funny little side note to bring up right because most people when we talk about zappa it's it's the same guy that made you know um absolutely free is the same guy that made shake your booty right it's i mean one is mothers of invention one is zappa solo but it's all frank Right. Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how I look at it too. But uh, I wanted to bring this up just as a little funny sort of conversation piece and to show the box set because this is a cool little set. Got some cool live stuff too. I'm all for it. Frank Live is second to none, man. Second to none. Uh, Transatlantic, one of the best side projects in modern Prague. And I wish it was more than a side project because they kind of seem to put this. You know, they go out when they feel like it and then put it on the shelf when they feel like it. I mean, obviously, I know they have other great bands like Mike is now part of Dream Theater again. Uh, Neil Morse has, you know, the Neil Morse thing going on. Roy Nestalt has uh, Flower Kings. Obviously, Pete T has Marillion. And uh, Ted Leonard's on this, too. And obviously, he's got whatever Ted Leonard does. He, he's got kind of all over the place. You know, Spock's Beard. Spock's Beard and Chant. Lots of things, right? So... Obviously, I know Lauren is a big fan. What about you, Scott? Um, Transatlantic for me, uh, it, well, it's it's wonderful music in general. Yeah. The, the first two albums, particularly Bridge Across Forever, are essential. Yeah, Br Bridge Across Forever, that entire album is essential. I have something of a perception of musicians and i'm not going to name any names because there are a bunch of us out there that are guilty of it who go into a project with the idea oh i'm going to write this 70 minute epic and call it all one song yeah without <laughs> thinking about the implications of such when i do my own music and that's the only perspective i have on creating music because that's you know and everyone else is the same way I don't sit down to write a 14 minute song. I write until the song says that it's finished. And right. if it's 14 minutes, it is right. Yeah. I just, I, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like it's, it's not, look, I'm not going to say it's topographic padded, but some of their more <laughs> recent stuff there, there's, there's a, they could have been edited somewhat. It doesn't ruin it because it's so powerful. That's the thing about Neil that is so, essential to everything neil does by the way his very first solo album is required listening if you've never heard it mm. it's, it's more of a singer songwriter almost a mm -hmm. almost a, a pop album it's it's absolutely enthralling it's there's not much prog about it there's one long sort of proggy song at the end of it but the rest of it is just great singer songwriter stuff and it is wonderful he so never called it's he not never me, is it i'm sorry What's that album called? It's just called Neil Morris. It's just called it's Neil called? Morris. The very yeah. first solo. He was still in Spock's beard when he put it out. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's excellent stuff. You can find it. Dig that up. Uh, he never loses sight of melodic power. He, things never get too atonal or angry with him. Uh, so you've always got that to latch on to. I must admit that I listened to The Whirlwind. And that's really the last transatlantic I've listened to. I have not heard absolute. I've not heard anything after that. And part of that is because shortly after that time, I started writing my own stuff for myth of logic. And yeah. frankly, I did not want to be influenced by it too much. Right, right, right. It's yeah. Such, it's, it such a, inspiring. 
it's such a big chunk. And, and I know how inspired I get by that stuff. I didn't want to be influenced by it. Now that my trilogy is coming to an end, I'm going to start a, sort of start allowing myself to dive back into some of those really substantial things that everybody loves from the last few years that I've kind of been denying myself. What you're holding right now is one of those things that I'm looking forward to listening to later this year when I'm finally finished. So, well, you know what? This this is the live album, and it's got stuff. It has the whirlwind suite. It has some stuff from Simpty as well, mm -hmm. um, but it also has the DVD of them playing live at the uh, at the Olympia Theater, mm -hmm. and it has them doing all of the Absolute Universe like in order, the whole record, top to bottom, and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did not. I did not mean to imply that I don't like Transatlantic. I love no, Transatlantic. No. I own a whole wad of their output. I have an autographed. There's there was a very limited release remix of Simpty that was done by Royna Stolt, and really? I have I have an autographed copy of that. That but, was actually the first mix. Was it the first mix? I I, yeah. love, I prefer it in but almost he, every so way. So do I. So do yeah. I. It's a lot more guitar, obviously. A lot more guitar heavy. And he has said that uh, you know it was the first mix that was uh, rejected, and he sort of he puts it rather diplomatically. It's quite clear mm -hmm. what he's getting at because the same thing happened with the last album when they had to do two different mixes of it because they couldn't agree on you know <laughs> not just two different mixes but two I've different been... versions. I've been really fortunate in that I've gotten to see the Flower Kings twice. They've actually been here twice. They were here for the Adam and Eve tour, and they were here on the Paradox Hotel tour. So, I did see Transatlantic twice, but I've not seen Transatlantic. No. Yeah, they yeah. came to Montreal, so we took the trip to Montreal ah, on uh, Whirlwind right. and Kaleidoscope, and they were both pretty fantastic shows. I got to say. Right. The, uh, the one thing about I've got plenty of their live DVD video stuff. The one thing I love about watching that band is that they're clearly just enjoying playing with each other. You know, they're yeah. they're, they're just having a great time. I think it comes back to what like when Cody was saying, like, oh, I wish it was, you know, they could do it more often and stuff. The, the thing is, you, if you look at it from the perspective of a marriage, those guys have their five or their four marriages. Yeah. You know, yeah. they've got their dream theater, their Marillion, their flagging. And this is like they're going out with the boys. Night. This is the mistress. <laughs> oh, the mistress, yeah. <laughs> this is the mistress. Good. This is only, the mistress. There's only so much time for going out with the boys or mistresses. Yes. And you have to really devote most of your time to your marriage, as some, yeah. some of us know yeah. all too well. I yeah. hope, I hope that, well, obviously, we know the Dream Theater thing with Mike back is going to be pretty huge it already is you know now yeah. that band doesn't doesn't do anything that doesn't get a hundred thousand likes immediately on it on facebook you know it's like people are just and a hundred thousand complaints well and and well yeah then there's then there's those people but yeah. you know like they complained when mangini came in the band and now the same people are complaining when mangini left the band so you know what it it's you're not going to be able to please everyone they've it's complained just, about they've complained about every single thing under the sun for 25 years from what i've seen well dream theater yeah. fans are a unique group of people and a lot of the dream theater fans i know uh do not like any other prog they are only dream theater fans and and most of the rest of the music they listen to is something completely different so um you know most prog fans at the very least appreciate dream theater yeah um yeah i'm glad they're out there frankly uh it's you they we, the world, the music world needs bands like Dream Theater and King Crimson and other bands to show us how far is too far. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We need that yardstick. We need, okay, that's what those guys are doing. That's too much for me. I can't do that. You know, there's, mm. uh, I, I, they're, they're, I, you know, I love me some Dream Theater. I've been a Dream Theater. I bought, I bought Dream and Day Unite on cassette. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the recommendation of an article in Rip magazine back in 88 or 89, whenever it was. So I've been there from the beginning. Uh, they're one of my favorite bands. I love, love, love the Flower Kings. Just love that band. Always have. Star, or, uh, um, Space Revolver is the apex for me. I adore that album. I'll accept the Chicken Farmer song. I skip that one every time. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> oh no, no, it's not that one. It's not that one. It's uh, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. It does not belong on that album. Right. It's such a lousy song. It really is bad. But the rest of it is genius. It's just genius. Yeah. And you know, we should give a, a shout out to Rhina Stolt, um, because that man, I don't think he does anything else in his life aside from make music. Do you have the invention of knowledge that the album he did with John Anderson? I do have it. Oh, yeah. that it's been a long time since I've heard I it. I love, I love that album. I love it. I, I struggle a bit with that one. You know, I love both those guys. I, I find it a, a bit formless. Um, it's sort of, I can I can never remember anything about it when it's over, and it's it's strange. It, it took I, me a while I, to get into it, but my dad, it's one of the last birthday presents my dad ever gave me, so I kind of had an emotional attachment to it. Right. It, it kept yeah. me involved, and I've listened to it enough now that I've I've become more familiar with it, so there's some of that, but I really like that album. Yeah, yeah i got to go back and listen to it again, because I haven't listened to it probably since it came out. I have it, but I haven't listened to it probably since 2016. Emotional uh, attachments are, of course, very vital and important, as we all know. Mm -hmm. It's why, you know, it's why I love uh, Presto by Rush so much, because it was my first tour, you know, and a lot of people are like, oh, I can't stand that period. You know, it's like the production and they're right about the production. But but I love the album, you know, like, it's got so many fond memories for me. I can't not, you know, and, yeah, that, that I, I agree. It's it's that album is. The, they were so focused on writing great songs and they just nailed it. The Pass is on that album. Yeah, that's um, good. Hand Over Fist, the song Presto, uh, Super Conductor. Come on, man. I mean, that is old school rush of, you know, probably 10 years prior to that, just laying it out there. Now, it, yeah, it's, true. it is a thin sounding album, but that's yeah, it's bit, yeah, it is. It, But I don't care. Like no, I, just I, don't love, I love the I love songs. It. I loved the show. You know, I was I saw seventeen. That show too. <laughs> I was seventeen in in nineteen ninety, and and I saw uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. I mean, there's a get more Canadian. We lined up at Maple Leaf Gardens for tickets. You know, <laughs> <laughs> these are things that would never happen now. And you know, and that was an experience in itself. But you know, the show and you know, Voivod came on and did their opening, and I couldn't wait for them to finish because I just wanted to see Rush. You know, and they came out. Alex had long hair again. They played Xanadu. Like, it was incredible. Yeah. It was, it was like the non keyboard rush was kind of back, right? Well, then, and, and that tour was quite yeah. short compared with previous tours. They were, at, that was actually the first period in, in the life of Rush where they were starting to think about retirement and sort of easing back a little bit. And it was quite a short tour. They didn't go a lot of places on that tour. Um, and, I think they had so much fun as a result. They said, okay, we're not ready to retire. We just kind of need to decrease a little bit. But yeah, that was a, I love yeah. the whole look of the production. Neil had those dark purple drums with the gold hardware. It just <laughs> looked so cool. And the Xanadu big... comes, comes back after yeah. being on for a while. For the first time they resurrected it. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing and... what you were saying about the short tour and then wanting to sort of slow down a bit was, after that immense tour they did for hold your fire yeah and getty got really sick and exhausted mm -hmm. you know and he was doing so much on stage he always did anyway yeah. but he was he was just he said he felt like a robot yep you know on yeah. stage and then it was starting to get not fun and maybe you can That'd hear a bit fun is number one when you can hear a bit of that on on the show of hands live album which i love I do too. It's, it's, I yeah. love it, but you. I think you can sort of hear the that creeping in a bit. Like this is becoming a lot of work now, right? Yeah. There's a lot less. Well, I mean, Getty, they were on for like 15 years at that point. Like they were nonstop. You know. Have you yeah. guys read my F in life? Yes. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah, I have it, but I wanted to read from it the, from the sound of his uh, from from the sound of his testimonials from that period. He kind of did a lot back to himself. He, you know, would take the the reins and the the bull by the horns for things like mixing, which I love his line about Getty calls mixing the death of hope. The death of hope. Yeah, I, I love that. I too. love that because he's not wrong. He's not right. wrong. When you write a song, you're filled with so much enthusiasm and so much hope. And it's, yes, this is exactly what I want to say. And by the time it's out there for public consumption, 
it's whatever, <laughs> six, eight months, a year, it's later. And it's kind of worn around the edges for you. But when you get to the mixing stage, you want it to have that same impact that it had for you when you wrote it. And that's what you're reaching for. And you can never <laughs> quite grab it. So I know what he means. But yeah. And, and I while think, you're while you're writing it, it's it's still yours. Yeah, it's it's not it's mm. not even born yet. It's like anticipating the birth of a child almost. It's out in the world and it's now theirs. Yeah, it's, it's not mine. Exactly. Yep. But uh My F in Life is a fantastic book. I, I reviewed that one for for Velvet Thunder and I, I really did a very thorough review because I thought I deserved it because he was so open, so honest, very bare in in some spots, you know. Yeah, and, it was. Yeah, uh, pretty eye opening things that I that I never knew, and I've followed every sentence that those guys have uttered in public for thirty five years, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Speaking of open and honest, here is another. Here's a solo album that was a total departure from the sound of this guy in the band that he was in. Uh, obviously, I know both of you guys know this album. I know at least Lauren loves this album as well. I'm not, not sure about Scott. What is it? But, uh, I love this record. I'll tell you in a second. He had just gone through a horrible uh, separation with his wife at the time. And you can really hear that through the emotion in some of the songs on this. It's face, face value. value. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's face value. I think this album is absolutely awesome. I know some... I don't know. If you're a Genesis fan, I feel like you should like this because it's very musically interesting and the, the writing is really good. It's got great production. Um, obviously, this is where a lot of people, this isn't where it started, but this is where a lot of people first heard that gated drum sound. Obviously, that would start on the Peter Gabriel 3 record. Mm -hmm. but, uh, what do you guys think of this one? A do or don't? Well, what I do, what, what I like the most about Face Value is that he did what he went the complete opposite way of what was expected of a drummer to do with a solo album at that time. Yeah, absolutely. He could have made a big brand X -y sort of fusion -y kind of thing, you know, and have all these guest players and make it really showy, but he didn't. He went for stripped down raw emotional songs that resonated so much with the public that it shot all the way up the charts, you know, when he put it in the air tonight and, and suddenly he was, you know, his career was born on, on, on his own. I agree. That's that man. I can't. I'm a diehard Phil Collins fan and fan of this album. And you just said everything I could have possibly said. <laughs> he, I don't think he ever achieved the same uh, emotional involvement with his art at that point. What's what stuns me when I listen to that album? Any anyone else in any other situation, first of all, doesn't write those songs and doesn't deliver the performance the vocal performance it's so shattering when you listen to him singing you, it's the sound of a man eating his own heart mm -hmm. and you can hear it 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 completely it just runs out of the grooves of that album you can hear it it's so affecting i think um, a good part of the reason for that too is that those are really just the demos yep on that album they're yep. they're you know he didn't go back and redo it all and and ruin it which can happen when, you know, a lot of times you'll hear a demo and think, God, oh, that's way better than the one they ended up over polishing on the record. You know, that the, this isn't polished at all. It's, it's, it's just him sitting down there, writing these songs, playing them. And there you go. There's a genuine quality that I don't think he ever recaptured after that first album. He made, he made more really, really good records, obviously, but there's a, there's a genuine, direct, honest, open quality to his vocals in particular, delivering those songs on that wonderful album. Yeah, oh, that, that's a great point, man. You guys, you guys got all the bases covered, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna say except, well, you know, I, just to piggyback off what you guys are saying, absolutely, you can feel the emotion behind every line and every lyric on this album, and the drumming, man. I mean, even you know, this isn't really probably at the time. I don't know because I wasn't around, but. You know, with all the stuff with the Brand X and Genesis and stuff, and people who were following him from that might not have expected this, but you still get tracks like Droned and Hand in Hand and stuff with the really yeah. cool, uh, yeah. jazz figures and things like that, right? For sure. But, you know, it, it could have been a more bruford -ish kind of album or, or something, you know, or uh, I, I don't know. But yeah, no, there you go. <laughs> But yeah, I was prepared, man. <laughs> I would I would agree with Bill. That's not the record I would be holding up, but 
Yeah. I would be I'd be holding up one of a kind, but yeah. Hold on. I love them all. They're oh, yeah, they're um, the, Bill Solo stuff is is stunning. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. Yeah, Bill Bill Bruford albums are never far out of reach in this room. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get that UK box set off the shelf again today, Cody. We've we've done <laughs> I brought it down for two shows prior to this and it's like about 300 pounds. Is that the main box, the big box set? Yeah, the del the com Deluxe Collector's Edition or whatever. Yeah, I was never able to get that. I did get the uh, the box set of Night After Night. Uh, right, yeah. Which is Extended so version. nice to hear that whole show. Brilliant, yeah. Oh, love that band. Love that yeah. band. There's there's a ton of UK flowing through Myth of Logic. There really is. Um, yeah. I try not to be too obvious about it, but eh. That's a great <laughs> band to be influenced by. Oh, yeah. Such great stuff. We're going to jump the prog ship just for a, a minute or two here. I got a couple of ones that we might want to talk about. Um, of course, this one came out in 1970, and it was such a massive departure from what people would have expected from this band. He was in the most famous band in the world. You already know where I'm going with this. Bay City uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Partridge Family. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, <laughs> he recorded everything on this album himself. He didn't even he, later, he would go to obviously form another band, which was very successful. And in some albums, he would credit his wife and stuff. This album is 100% just him. And, uh, you know, when, when people would have expected what he had done previously and then heard this, it is such a different thing. That's McCartney. That's that's Paul McCartney. I mean, this does not sound like a Beatles album at all. Minus maybe maybe I'm amazed. Sure, but this is such a different. Uh, you know, this is just him saying, "I'm not a Beatle anymore. I can do whatever the hell I want." Right? Sure. Just, well, just... And if he had played, maybe I'm amazed with the Beatles. It probably would have sounded mostly similar. I think, depending on how yeah. how uh, domineering he was with it, you know, because he could sometimes be. I'd reckon, I'd reckon that Paul McCartney is possibly the single greatest pop rock songwriter in history of music. Um, I used to say when I was in my more inflammatory moments and, and you know, I got into some arguments with people that the most the single most important musician of the 20th century is Paul McCartney. Mm. Well, I, I wouldn't argue that. I wouldn't argue no, it. That's for sure. No one's art. No, no one's angry here, man. Yeah. <laughs> In the Beatles, out of the Beatles, it, it hits Paul, you know. I yeah, mean, more important wise, yeah, I would probably agree. I think my my own favorite is more along the lines of Paul Simon, but another Paul McCartney, very solid choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I and love, again, I love Macca. Yeah. It, again, he left Simon and Garfunkel and had a massive solo career away from Art Garfunkel, Art Garfunkel, and did things the way he wanted to do them, right? Well, and as, as he did with Simon and Garfunkel, since he yeah, pretty much, too. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but but this is really, especially McCartney one, two, and three. They're even different than all the other albums in his solo catalog. Yeah, mm. like they much. don't sound. This doesn't sound like Wildlife, which doesn't sound like Ram, which doesn't sound like Wings, and none of them sound like Give My Regards to Broad Street. <laughs> you know, that one, yeah, much, yeah, yeah. That is a that is a, a don't for me. I mean. How dare you come on here and start <laughs> remixing for no one and all these classic Beatles songs? And hey, I can't say how dare you because he is Paul McCartney and I I love him. He did, <laughs> but he but, dared. but he he did dare, and you know not you know as much as again he's one of those. He's got thirty albums out. If you like twenty five of them, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good ratio. ratio. Then there's four or five of them, you know, that every McCartney fan goes, yeah, maybe that's not one of his best ones. But there's there are few and I far like, between. I like Flaming Pie a lot. I think that one doesn't get enough credit anymore. I'd agree with that. Yeah, beautiful yeah. album. Like I was saying about the latter, again, that came around to the time I was born, and my my parents, my mom and dad, both loved that album so much. So that definitely rubbed off onto me. I know every lyric. I know every song. I could probably sing the songs for you backwards. I'd absolutely love that record and i listen to it still solid from time to time now sure. flaming pie and that is a is very inspired by the beatles stuff obviously the anthology and thing we got tara o'reilly in the house what's up tara <laughs> go on the boys <laughs> okay <laughs> the irishisms we love it hi tara <laughs> hi tara your cds are on the way tara 
Yes, yes, they are. But they're stuck in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, hers are somewhere out over the Atlantic Ocean right now. <laughs> I know. I'm just um, but yeah, so like, kudos to McCartney because on all the straight up McCartney albums, obviously he'd find a band with wings and other guys that played, but on the albums that are just billed as McCartney 1, 2, and 3, he does all of it, everything on them. Mm -hmm. McCartney 3, um, you know, if you that, that came out about three, four years ago. There's some people that didn't give it the attention that it actually does deserve. Because he wrote that in lockdown, and he does he produces it, mixes it, he plays every, he wrote everything on it. Nobody else had any involvement. It is just Paul, and there's some really good tunes on that. So McCartney three, if if uh, if you guys don't remember it that well, you got to go there again. A true solo album, yes, yeah, the truest sense of the word. And and going back to to Uncle Phil there, I know you don't like this album as much, Cody, but both sides was like that. It like, is, it is absolutely played everything, even bagpipes. Um, yeah, he produces it too. He said guitar, but I think he samples the guitar and then plays it on a keyboard. It doesn't. <laughs> I think that's what he does. It doesn't quite sound like he's playing guitar to me. I know you might remember there was a time around uh, "Dance Into the Light" when he started showing up in videos holding a, a Rickenbacker. No, I don't. I don't remember playing guitar, and it was kind of strange. You know, I was thinking. Phil, you know, like, look him up. There's some videos from that period. It was a weird little time, the mid '90s for those guys, because Tony Banks uh, had a a video for one of the songs from uh, uh, Strictly Inc., where he's standing and playing the keyboards. Mm. You know, behind, and I, I've never seen that before. I was like, that looks weird. <laughs> Strange times. How about some of these albums? I know I was talking to Scott the other day. And uh, and we were talking about how there's going to be a couple of metal albums that pop in here. Oh well, I love both of those. Me too. Um, Me too. I mean, this guy broke away from Sabbath and became more famous than than he was with them at the time. I mean, you think you start having to tunes like obviously the Blizzard of Oz record, which I this was the one I was able to pull, but uh, this one came after it, but. That album was a real tra trailblazer for 80s rock and metal at the time. And so was this, yeah. Holy Diver. Yeah, sure, yeah. Those Blizzard of Oz, I think, was originally going to be the name of Ozzy's new band before they changed that and made the decision to just call him Ozzy Osbourne, and they made the album named Blizzard of Oz. Yeah, he was, he was apparently quite nervous about being viewed as a solo artist, and he wanted another band. Um and eventually, you know, he was talked into, no, this has got to be Ozzy Osbourne. And so he relented. But yeah, those are two extremely satisfying solo careers right there. Uh, I agree. Very few boners in either of those catalogs. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, he, Dio never made a bad record. No, in, he didn't. In, in, in my view, uh, find me a video or a recording of him singing off key. He just didn't do it. I was actually fortunate. I got to meet Ronnie one time, if I could tell the story very briefly. Yeah. Oh, for sure. uh, he was backstage and holding court with a bunch of us fans. And he was such a gentleman and such a warm person. We t actually talked very little about him. He wanted to know about us, where we were from, what we thought of the show. He wanted to know, and he was paying very close attention. I remember this as a, you know, I was whatever I was, 18, 19, something like that. Uh, I, I was a budding singer at the time. I was starting to really take it seriously. I was taking proper vocal lessons from a classically trained teacher. Yeah. And I was really starting to take it seriously. And I asked him, I said, Ronnie, what do you do for a warm up? And Ronnie, at the, he was wearing one of those Western shirts that were popular at the time amongst <laughs> backstage rock stars uh you know with the the ivory buttons and the stuff all over it. he reached into a shirt pocket and he pulled out a package of stuyvesants which is a very strong german unfiltered cigarette and he said this is my warm-up warm-ups are a waste of notes really that's what he said to me and i've never forgotten that because Every performance the man ever did that you can find a recording of, he walks out on stage and he grabs that mic, and there it is. He there was amazing. is that voice. You would have never guessed he was a smoker. I mean, oh, 
Yeah, no. most smokers can't sing like that. I'm going to put it out there. Most oh, for sure. Yeah, he's yeah. he's amazing. He and well, the you, thing about him too is he really was a professional who had to unfortunately sometimes work and rub up against people that were quite troublesome and problematic in a working relationship. You know, guys like Richie Blackmore, guys oh, like yeah. Tony Iommi at the time. Who you know, I love Tony Iommi, but he wasn't always at his best. And, yeah. Uh, and well, no one. Like and, and and I think Ronnie wasn't really like that. He does. He just never come across that way to me. In all the interviews I've watched and stuff too, you know, and the stories I've read about him. He attributes. If you've not read his the the uh, biography that Wendy put out a few years ago, it's excellent. But it stops at. Uh, Oh, it stops after the first solo album, I believe. It it ends. You know, there's more story to tell. Uh, but he uh, he attributed um, his vocal power to the fact that he grew up playing trumpet. Mm. And so, I mean, when you play trumpet and play it well, and by all accounts, he was a very good trumpet player. Um, you have to know your body very well and how to breathe. And because right. you sometimes need to, exhale for a long period of time with a trumpet so right yeah what that's yeah. one of the that's one of the treasures of my life is that i actually got to meet and have a few words with him yeah that's cool yeah. i got one more that we'll talk about well i wanted to kind of give a mention to some of these too richard yes this is live hello richard fusey from the deep nuggets family um i wanted to give a mention to some of these before we get into one more then we'll then we'll probably call it a day but uh, perfect circle from Tool, or not perfect circle from you know Maynard side project, who is from Tool. That's what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't sound like Tool. This 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 is not. This is probably the more alternative side to Tool, alt alt metal kind of. As to where Tool is more prog prog ish, this has moments of that, but it is still very much a different approach. And he was doing it while he was with Tool. You know, like the album before this, you know, Tool was writing Lateralis and he was writing Murdenoms with this band. And so he was doing both pretty much within the same two-year gap. And then after Lateralis, then there's this. This was their last record for like 18 years, but I, I think this is their best one. So if you guys wanted to check them out, this is definitely worth, worth a listen. Um, don't go in expecting Tool because it is a different approach. Um, another one. This guy. Oh, yeah. He's on my list. Yeah. I mean, David Gilmour, I think that this one, most people would probably say the other one, and that's totally cool. They wouldn't be wrong, but this is probably my favorite solo album of his. It yeah. is, it's not even really prog. It's kind of like a pop rock record with Simon Phillips on drums. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like he kind of... I'm going to say he pulled the Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend actually wrote a couple of songs on this. So there <laughs> yeah. you go. But um, a do or don't. A do. Do. Yeah, yeah. By all means. Yeah. Anything with David Gilmore's name on it is totally worthy of a listen. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Agree. I love that album. So. And then uh, one more is obviously probably a solo career that we couldn't have missed on this, uh, on this show today because we are all massive Genesis fans. We talked about Steve Hackett, Mike Rutherford, and Phil Collins. So obviously, Peter. Yep. Peter Gabriel. Yeah, I was at uh, I was at Chicago style pizza in Hamilton the other day, and uh, it's just a small pizzeria. Lauren would know the place, and uh, <laughs> it was just it's just a small uh, restaurant pizzeria type thing. Probably the best pizza in Ontario. But uh, I walked in. And I hadn't been there for years. I walked in and I see a picture. I'm like, this guy looks like Peter Gabriel in this picture. But obviously, if you guess it, it's going to be incorrect. So I say to the woman working, I said, who are these two guys on this photo, on this signed photo here hanging up? And she said, she was a young girl. She, she's like, I'm not sure. And so she takes it back. <laughs> she takes it off the wall. And she goes, who is this? And one of the older cooks comes out and goes, that's Daniel Lanois and Peter Gabriel. Right. So they had signed a photo for the owner. I guess they had had dinner. Like this photo was from like 1987. Like so, wow. so Peter Gabriel. And I guess they had uh, they had went there because Daniel Lenoir is from there. He's from Hamilton. That's just about 20 minutes from here. That's where Lauren is just outside of as well. You're in Burlington, right? So yeah, close. You're probably closer than I am actually. But yeah. uh, um, 
yeah, so just a cool little tidbit of uh, info there. That was so cool. I had I took a picture of it and I put it up on my Facebook page. But uh, it was so cool. You know, those guys at at uh, Chicago style pizza in Hamilton like thirty five years ago. <laughs> Obviously, one of the most experimental artists ever in history. Um, and uh, he, he Genesis was just like he was just getting going at that point. You know, he still hasn't stopped looking for the next thing with his with his sound and his solo career. Do or don't, guys. <laughs> oh, it's huge, huge do. He, I know. <laughs> he still takes um, still takes risks too. You know, he goes out on that tour and plays practically the entire album, which yeah. is not done anymore. You know, nowadays, and and of course, he faced some backlash from people who are like, "Well, he didn't play this. He didn't play that." You know people that wanted to go and just have their fun, good time show where they sing along and clap to the songs they know, you know, and maybe there'll be a couple of new ones. He played a whole ton of new ones. That's a, that's a, a risk, a, a bold and risky move. You got to, you got to respect a choice like that. And the CD wasn't out yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they did with the lamb. Going yeah, I saw that. Lamb. I saw that tour and it was absolutely fantastic. It was so good. I, I saw it in Toronto, and uh, I, you know, he he had dropped most of the singles, right? He had dropped most of the songs, so the diehards like us would have heard them. Yeah. But for the people that were just going to, you know, get drunk and hear Sledgehammer, yeah, that's that's you know, not to disrespect anyone and how they live, it's their choice. But there's lots of people like that who go to these concerts and they, they just want to hear Salisbury Hill or something. And oh, and, I know like the big top five songs and then that's that's what they want to hear they don't even know that he's got new stuff past you know us or something right yeah it's like but that that's kind of getting off point peter gabriel has a lot of diehard fans you guys watching you're looking at three of them right here yep <laughs> peter gabriel is a visionary icon he can do whatever he wants to do and you should enjoy it and yes. be happy that he does yeah and I am. Yeah, I'm. I'm thankful because to me, I I love Phil Collins. Mm -hmm. I, I love Phil. He is probably. I don't think he put out a bad record. I'm just gonna say it. I don't think he did anything that sucks. I don't think he. Not that Peter anything. Gabriel. Yeah, Peter Gabriel. Oh, definitely yeah. not. Yeah. I mean, not that anything that Phil Collins does is bad, or that not that anything that anyone else does that we mentioned here is 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 less than you know below par, but. I think that all eight of Peter Gabriel's studio albums, I'm not really including the soundtracks, although I could, They're, everything is great. But his eight defined solo albums from the first one up to this, I guess it's nine now, sorry. Amazing. Yeah, and it's I mean, one, and, one what, of the a, bunch. what a variety too. If you compare his first couple of sort of rock band based uh, approach with the more experimental studio things he was doing on three and four, and then going into the more commercial directions he took with some of the songs on so, and then into doing a, something like Passion. I mean, that's yeah. that's quite a variety and, a, and an interesting way to change up your style. Whenever I want to talk to somebody <laughs> about Peter Gabriel who may not know about them or may not have a concept of how important he is, and he is very important, I play them two songs to let them know what a brave artist he is and how committed he is. The first song would be Family Snapshot. Mm. Oh, yeah. Great one. Uh, he, he wrote a song from the perspective of Lee Harvey Oswald. And yeah. he, he made you bleed for that person. Yeah. That is, if that's not brave, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. If yeah. that's not brave, I don't know what is. Agreed. Uh, the well, other this certainly is. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is great. That's great. Yeah. See you. Um, the other one, the other one that I always play is San Jacinto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a beautiful piece of work, and, mm -hmm. and by his own admission, it tells this a very important civil rights story in the history of this country. Mm -hmm. Those two pieces of music, to me, if you can listen to those and not be somewhat affected by them, then you will never understand. Peter, that's that's just the very tiniest seed of the tree that he's created. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. There's some very yeah. moving songs over his career, especially Family Snapshot kills me. I I cannot listen to that song and not be affected by it. 
Yeah, or yeah, a song it, like it, it, I Grieve. A... You know the song I Grieve? Yeah. That's another one that really hits hard. Yeah. Or Mercy Street. You Mercy know? Street. Yeah, or Red Rain, you know, for different reasons, they all hit you, you know. It's very yeah. hair raising, literally hair raising songs. You know, he's a, a masterful yeah. uh, writer. He's He's got a couple of he's got a sad one on here too. He's got a, a tune called Playing for Time. And yeah, just, that's that's my favorite on that album. I, I would agree with that. Yep, that's yeah. my number one song on there. My number one song on this is I O. Um, but it, probably part of that has to do with the fact that, you know, I have a I I have a very similar outlook on life than that he does. And when I saw him play this album live, he played that song and he said, um, the song is about the reflection of who we are and how everything around us is alive and how everything that we give out where we're taking in and all of this sort of, it's, it's a very deep topic, you know, but you, and he, he was going in depth to it and to the audience. I'm like, man, I relate to you so much just by what you're saying and the, and the stuff he sings about in some of his songs for an artist to have that impact on you and to be able to go out and play a song like I O and have it really reach into your heart and you know make you feel like you are to to give you that connection it's all about like this album a big thing about this is connecting to other other people and things around you and stuff and so he really portrays that very well throughout the songs and especially in the live setting when when i saw him play this thing live yeah and, she, and I, think older, I gotta stop you know <laughs> as you get older too uh, songs like playing for time resonate with you much, much, much more. Or I grieve, or father and son. You know the, these songs. You know you you start to look at things differently as you age. Thanks, as I'm Jeff. sure, <laughs> as I'm sure you've heard pe old people say a million times, right? But it's true. And, no, it uh, is true. Uh, and I'm 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 doing that even at 25, you know, to to have that sort of outlook and, and feel about about life and how you know we're just a we're a one piece of the greater picture, you know. <laughs> but <That's> anyway, <laughs> that was a super fun conversation, guys. If Thank I may, you. Cody, I have sure. to ins I have to insert one. I had a whole list of things that I wanted <laughs> to ahead. mention. I have one that I cannot. Uh, when you talk about solo artists. This guy really was a solo artist. He was in a couple of different bands before he started his very brief solo career. My very favorite record of all time is an album called The Shaming of the True. Kevin Gilbert. A man's name is Kevin Gilbert. And everybody watching this, if you do not know about Kevin Gilbert, go and educate yourself. The absolute genius that is Shaming of the True. It had to be completed by Nick D. Virgilio and a few other of Kevin's friends because he passed away before he was able to complete it. Yeah, the Shaming right. of the True is my very favorite record. If I could only ever listen to one record for the rest of my life, it would be The Shaming of the True, yeah. period. His earlier okay. stuff is all great as well. He had a band called Giraffe. He had a very good band called Toy Matinee that was yeah. mainly a studio creation. But... Yeah. Some of the best, and uh, yeah, his his solo album Thud also right up there. Thud yeah. is stunning. We we've talked about him a couple of times here. People have brought him up. I've I've played him a few times on the show. He uh, uh, Shadow Self and oh yeah, um, or his Jennifer version, One. <laughs> yeah, or or the was it the Fugue Sweet Sweet Fugue, Fugue? Uh, Suit Fugue Suit Fugue Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the uh, the not the most recent box set. But the prior box set that was CD, I've got both of them. Um, it actually has all the parts of Suit Fugue written out, and you can follow along with them. It, right. Go Be if cool. you're watching this, go seek out Kevin Gilbert. You will be rewarded with yeah. some very well constructed music. Kevin Kevin almost became the singer in Genesis. Yeah. After Phil left, and prior to them doing Calling All Stations. It's my considered opinion from things that I've heard from people uh, who were close to that situation. Um, I think they were intimidated by Kevin. Kevin was a bright, shining star who was only going to burn out. He did everything, and he did it all well. And I think maybe Mike and Tony just wanted a guy who would just sing. 
and what they probably didn't know is that Kevin would have done anything they told him to do. He sure. loved Genesis. Yeah, he does an amazing version of Back in New York City. Oh, yeah, it's on that uh, Supper's Ready. Supper's Tribute Ready, yeah, yeah. yeah that's oh. fantastic. Yeah. And of course, you know, he did that big lamb show yeah, with, with Nick. And... With Giraffe, Nick played drums, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. He, he, Shaming of the True and Thud, anything yeah. with Kevin's name on it, go find it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't let this show go by without mentioning my favorite well, solo let, artist. Oh, you let me do one too then. Sure. I'll do a quick one. Okay. Um, quick one while he's away. <laughs> mine, mine would have to be Peter Hamill's The Silent Corner and the Empty Stage. Nice. Um, cool. Huge Vandergraaf fan and, and just as big a fan of Peter Hamill. Mm -hmm. um, I met him once and when you were talking about when you met Dio and what a warm person he was. And Peter Hamill was like that too. It was just a chance encounter, you know, and he, I, I just went, Peter, because I saw him and he just came beelining straight for me with his hand stuck out ready for a shake. And it was like the strongest handshake I'd ever felt like, um, yeah, anyway. and how else do you think he plays piano like that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, silent corner in the empty stage is a brilliant album with, uh, pieces that are basically Vandergraaf anyway. Um, the awesome. house is not a home and. Uh, we lie. might have to do another one of these because I have a I whole so. <laughs> I have a whole wad of of people I was gonna I was gonna mention, but yeah, I wasn't I didn't even prepare anything, but I could have just kept going off on whatever. We should do a part two. <laughs> we, we, we will do, yeah, a, we'll part do a part two. two. Yeah, we and, should do one. We can uh, we can uh, aim for that next weekend. Then, if you guys want to do a part two, maybe we can bring Matt Brown on and uh, and 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 see what's up. Sure. Who knows? All right. I'm up for it. <laughs> All right. You guys stay tuned. Part two coming next week because there's a couple others that I wanted to mention too. And so to give us another to give us another 70 minutes would just be a perfect time to talk about this. And I know the viewers are liking it. We're getting lots of cool comments here. So yeah, heck with right. it. Let's do another one on next Saturday then. All right. Work for me. All right. It's a, it's signed, sealed, and delivered. I'm yours. There we go. <laughs> hey right. thank you guys so much for joining us today we got lauren murphy from the garden of delights on deep nuggets radio you'll hear him tonight at five o'clock uh p.m eastern standard time that's two on the pacific but that's every saturday night so even if you're watching this way after the fact you can still go ahead next weekend and he'll be there you got scott from the band myth of logic of course you can go get his records off of Bandcamp. And uh, you said it was mythoflogic.com. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, mythoflogic.com. Mm -hmm. Support, support this great music, and uh, thank you guys so much for watching the show today. And Thanks, we, Juan. we yeah. will be back. Uh, well, next weekend. And if you watch the Prague Corner, Scott and I will actually be there tomorrow talking about. Actually, I'm not on the show tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll be there tomorrow. We'll be talking You'll about. Be there. Pop, pop oh, is going tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I next see. week, next week. Scott will be there, and we will be talking about our Desert Island albums. I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag. So is going to be on there, and so is Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. Now, the other couple, you're going to have to guess what they are, but right. I digress. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining, uh, joining on the panel today. Much love to both of you guys, and much love to everyone watching. Thank you so much. We'll see you next weekend. All right. <laughs> Rock on!